What's up guys? So today is the video for the basic perfumer that doesn't know where to get started. You know you want to start creating your perfumes at home, but you're not quite understand where to start, where should I buy my materials, uh, what kind of materials, what kind of things do I need to, to get all this started? Because sure, you can just go out and buy some essential oils and just start dropping things together and do it yourself, but you're, you want to do it the right way. So in this video, we're going to tackle all the basic things and all the basic steps that the, the, the DIY beginner is going to want to go with uh, in order to create their own perfumes at home. We're going to discuss equipment. We're going to discuss storage of your materials, whether if it's in, uh, if you have a dedicated room, uh, like a perfumer's organ, or maybe if you have storage cabinets. We're going to discuss the materials. Uh, now in this video, I'm actually going to pick out some like starter materials. Now there's hundreds and hundreds of aroma chemicals and essential oils and things that you can buy. And that's probably the one thing that most people get confused on uh, when they first start out because they don't know what to buy. There's just so many. They don't know what they do. Some of the names are confusing. So I hand selected a, a, a couple of things from each category, like categories of citruses maybe categories of woods, something from spices, something from ozonic. So I break it down and kind of handpick all some of the basic materials that you would need to get you started without having to dive deep into getting all these different little niche aroma chemicals to make all these different things. These are going to be some of the things that I pick out that I personally love to use. So instead of making your own rose accord, which can consist of maybe five to ten aroma chemicals, I'm going to pick out one single blend that you can purchase from these big fragrance companies like Givaudan or IFF or Simrise. So I'll pick all these different things out to get you started so you can start creating your own blends at home and then you can take it to the next level from there. And then the last thing we're going to discuss is where to buy all this stuff. Uh, where do you buy your equipment? Uh, where would you buy aroma chemicals here in the United States or anywhere in the world? So I have a couple go-to places that I personally love to buy from and I buy from every single week. I'm constantly spending, spending, spending money on this. This is an expensive hobby, just, to, just an FYI to get you in the know right now. You're gonna start this now and think, oh, I gotta spend all this money on all these things. And then you'll realize the next week you're gonna want more ingredients. You're gonna wanna try new things and it's just, you're gonna buy, buy, buy. So I handpicked uh, three different websites that I personally love going to, trustworthy sources, great materials. And yeah, so without further ado, let's get started. So now let's take a look at some of these materials that I picked out for the, the basic beginner, uh, first timer, if you will, uh, perfumer, for somebody that wants to start creating perfumes at home. So I've hand selected a whole bunch of things out of my arsenal. And quite honestly, this is only like a small percentage of my stuff. Uh, but I have everything grouped by categories, which I think that'll get you started off on the right foot uh, as far as uh, what you would probably enjoy using uh, or experimenting with without diving too deep into specific aroma chemicals. So the first group I have here is what I call the must-haves. Like these are the ingredients that every single perfumer or DIY perfumer is going to want in their arsenal. It's used in almost every modern day perfume and you're definitely going to want it. So the first thing we've got is galaxolide. Now, galaxolide is a, it's a musk, and I know a lot of people get turned off by musk. They're like, no, I don't like musk in my perfumes. But galaxolide is a very forgiving, clean musk. Uh, it has a very low odor threshold, so it's very hard to detect. You can easily overdose this in your perfume and be okay. So it's a very safe, clean musk. So if you had to go with a, just a, one musk out of your entire arsenal, start with this one. So then the next one I think everybody should have always, ISOE Super. ISOE Super is in every perfume nowadays. Um, it's more of a soft, velvety, woody scent, but again, it's a very low odor threshold. You can easily overdose this in your, perfu uh, your perfume and not even really smell it. It's there more of a, kind of like a blender. Uh, I would consider this more of a functional kind of ingredient than more of a scented ingredient. Now on the flip side, you've got Hedione. 
Hedion is much like Isoe Super, but instead of woody, uh, this is more of like a white narcotic floral, kind of like jasmine, if you will. Um, so again, very, very light scented. A lot of women's perfumes nowadays can go easily up to 20% of their perfume concentrate with just this ingredient alone. Really overused in the perfumery uh, industry. So this is a definite must have. And then the last one of the must haves is your basic old linalol. And linalol is a top note floral. It's very soft, it's very delicate, uh, and it actually brings a lot of lift uh, into your fragrances. So linalol is actually an aroma chemical that's found in a lot of florals. So this is definitely a must have. Now the next category, again, I'm gonna go back into a musk category. Say galaxolide wasn't quite your thing, it's too clean and you're like, I like a musky scent. If I had to choose one musk for the rest of my life, it would be exaltolide total from Furminich. Uh, this is, it's still a semi-clean musk. It's not as clean as galaxolide, but now it's getting into the more darker, sensual kind of musk. So if you had to have two musks and that was it, I would choose galaxolide in this one. So at least with having both, you have options depending on what perfume you're gonna go with. If you want a cleaner perfume, you go with galaxolide. If you want something a little bit more deeper, a little bit more sensual and muskier, exaltolide total. Now your next category is going to be your woods category and these are all per, you know pretty much base notes so woods can be all over the place in perfumes and it's very very subjective as far as preference so i've i've handpicked a couple things that i think fits into every kind of genre of perfume so for the first one you're definitely going to go you're going to want to get some cedar wood essential oil cedar wood Essential oil is found in so many colognes and perfumes. I mean, if it's a wood, I'd say probably 25% of perfumes out there that has a wood, it's probably cedar wood. It's, it's used that much. Now there's different kinds of cedar woods out there. This, like you can get cedar wood from Virginia, from Texas, from all different you know countries. I particularly got the one from Texas because it's just the basic generic cedar wood. Now the next one is black agar or black agar sometimes also known as oud uh, now this one in particular oud is very 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 expensive so this one that i chose is actually made by jivodan and it's black agar jivko very affordable uh, it's their synthetic reconstitution of what a, an agar or oud would smell like so if you can't afford a real oud uh, oil which is probably like hundreds and hundreds of dollars just for a small little vial this is your next best bet like a small bottle like this shouldn't cost you more than 15 20 dollars uh, so the next one is going to be somewhere in the lines of your sandalwoods sandalwoods are very popular in women's perfume as the wood of choice so Sandalwood, again, is a very, very expensive essential oil to obtain. It's probably way too expensive for the beginner or for somebody starting off. So I particularly chose, uh, there's an aroma chemical called Sandalore, or sometimes you can get one called Sandella. And this, again, is a aroma chemical kind of reproduction of what sandalwood oil would smell like. Saves you a ton of money. It's, I wouldn't say it's as good as the real thing, but when it's blended in a perfume, most people wouldn't know the difference. Uh, let's see, the next one would be patchouli. Patchouli oil is actually very obtainable. It's very cheap. Uh, there's different kinds of patchouli. Most people get turned off by patchouli though because it's very dirty, it's very earthy. So if I were to choose a specific patchouli, uh, Furminich makes one called Clearwood and clearwood is the cleaned up version of patchouli. It's, it's almost like the nice dry, grassy, woody patchouli without that dirt and skank in it. So if you were to get a patchouli oil and didn't know which one to get, start with clearwood first because it's very clean and very easy to work with. And then the last two I want to talk about in the woods category technically aren't necessarily woods, but they kind of fall in that category. And these are probably nice to have. You don't have to have them, but Juniper berry oil, even though it comes from a tree, it's, a, it's not necessarily a wood. Uh, this is more of a top note. It's kind of like a sweeter wood. So just imagine the leaves and the berries of a juniper berry tree. 
excellent, excellent, excellent top note. And then the last one is you're going to need some sort of fur, pine needle, kind of green scent, that Christmassy scent. Uh, so if you can't get a hold of any sort of pine essential oil, your next bet is probably going to be some cypress oil. This uh, particular one is a pure natural essential oil from Spain. Very affordable. Little bottle like this, probably like $10, $12. So the next category we're going to dive into now is your aldehydes. Now aldehydes are tricky to work with. Uh, they have to be heavily diluted because you can buy a small bottle, like say a small a little $5 bottle like this, and this will last you a long time because you're going to dilute it into larger bottles like this to usually 10%. So the four aldehydes that I would probably start off with is your C12MNA aldehyde. This is probably the most common aldehyde out there. It's, it's really old. It's been in perfumery for so many decades now. This aldehyde is, as with any aldehyde, it's very clean, uplifting, ar well, not aromatic, but just very, it creates this headspace for your perfume where it just gives everything this lift. And that's what an aldehyde does. But every aldehyde has a different facet or a different scent kind of profile to it. The C12 MNA is more of your dry amber um, kind of aldehyde. So it does give it that openness, that lift, but it's a little bit on the dry, warm amber side. It's good to have in your perfume if you're creating, well, like an amber-based perfume. The next one would be your C12 Lauric. This is strong, strong, strong. I have this diluted down to 5%. So this aldehyde is your basic go-to if you want that clean, soapy, uh, dried linens kind of aldehyde scent. This is a great, great clean aldehyde to have. Just dilute the heck out of it because it's strong. So now the next one we're going to talk about is aldehyde C10 decanol. And now this one, this is more of like a zesty orange peel aldehyde. So this usually is my first go-to choice of aldehyde if I'm creating like a citrus uh, summer scent uh, fragrance and I need something to give the top notes some lift. Uh, this one is so strong though. I have it diluted down to 2% and I'm probably going to dilute it down to 1% because one drop of this is still super strong in my blends. So if you want that uh, zesty, kind of bright, uplifting kind of aldehyde, your C10 decanol is probably a good choice to start with. Last but not least, this aldehyde technically is not an aldehyde. It's, they call it a so-called aldehyde because the people that invented this actually mismarketed it as an aldehyde because its odor strength is so strong, it reacts like an aldehyde, but it's chemical compounds Technically, it's not an aldehyde. And that is aldehyde, so-called strawberry C16. You don't need this one, but it depends on the nature of what you're gonna be creating in your perfumes in the future. I would say this is a great one for more feminine uh, perfumes. A lot of uh, feminine perfumes usually are on the sweeter, on the fruitier side. So if you want some sort of aldehyde to mimic that and give that top end some lift, your C16 strawberry aldehyde is usually a good, a good choice. So now the next category uh, is a very slim category because there's just so many to talk about, but that's your fruity category. So what I've selected for fruits uh, that are good starting points is some sort of apple accord. You're gonna want, uh, like Aventus is known for having a great apple opening. So is a, uh, oh, what is that? Nautica Voyage has a great apple, apple opening. So if I were to choose a single aroma chemical that mimics an apple note the best, that would be called manzanate. And this one, it's a, it's a very sweet apple. It's very generic. It's not red. It's not green apple. It's just a generic apple. It actually has a almost kind of like a kind of like apple cider scent too. It's sweet but it has a cider scent, but it, it blends so well for a top note. The next one would be more of on the feminine side. So if you like nectarines, apricots, and peaches, uh, of course you can try and find some sort of oil that does that, but certain fruits don't produce essential oil. So you're, you're kind of stuck with half to getting some sort of aroma chemical to do it. And my choice for that would be Nectaril from Givaudan. And again, this one is a very generic kind of apricot, nectarine, peach kind of scent. 
excellent top note, kind of goes from top to middle note. So this has got some good longevity. Uh, excellent for women's perfumes, which tend to be sometimes a lot of women's perfumes love to have that peachy opening. This is a good thing to have. And the last one in the fruit category I think everybody should have is some sort of pineapple accord. Now, pineapple itself, you, there is no pineapple essential oil. You can't really get anything like that. They have to be you know, remade through aroma chemicals. That's the only way about it. And instead of listing all the 10 ingredients of aroma chemicals that makes up of a pineapple, I, I hand selected just one uh, pre-blended accord that's actually made by creatingperfume.com and she just calls it the pineapple accord and it smells wonderful. It's thick, juicy, robust. It's, perf it's perfect for that Crete event is kind of pa uh, pineapple opening and it's very affordable. Like this little 15 ml bottle I think was 10 bucks or something like that and this is going to last a heck of a long time. Okay. So now that brings us to the floral category. And the floral category is so broad and there's so many different types of florals, but I've handpicked just a few that are more commonly and widely used in, the per, in perfumery. So obviously the first one is gonna be rose. Rose is used a lot in women's perfumes, not so much men's, but if it's done right, it's done awesome. Uh, but rose, if you try to build your own rose accord, you've, you're gonna have to build it with so many aroma chemicals. Again, you've gotta use citronellol, geraniol, PEA, dasmacone beta, you know, all these things. And instead of trying to get you all these different things, you can just go out and buy one from Givaudan called Rose Jivco 217. And again, this is their constant, this is their recreation, oh, it smells so good, of a generic rose. And it smells really lifelike to me, to be honest with you. It's not necessarily like a spicy rose, it's not a clean rose, it's not a red rose, it's not a white uh, rose. It's just your average generic rose accord and it's dirt cheap and it works wonders. I think everybody should have it as a first timer. The next one is your jasmines. Jasmine essential oil is ungodly expensive. I mean, just a small little vial like this, probably a hundred bucks and it won't last you long. So you have to rely on aroma chemicals. So you're gonna notice a theme with all these things that I'm showing you here is these big houses like IFF, Givaudan, Simrise, um, they make synthetic remakes of what would be an essential oil. So these big houses like Simrise, uh, Givaudan, IFF, they remake their own versions of these really expensive oils through aroma chemicals. And for Jasmine, I chose Jasmatone from Givaudan. Now there's different ones out there and like Ferminich makes Jasmine specialty. They're both Jasmines and they both smell wonderful. Um, but they're just kind of just a little bit different. I carry both because one is more sweeter. The other one is more delicate. Uh, if I were to choose one, I mean, they're both pretty much the same price too. I would say Jasmatone is probably a good first starter. If you can afford to get both on your first, you know, batch of things you're going to buy, you know, grab both and see which one you like. But Jasmatone is actually a really good one. Which now brings me to the iris, uh, the orris roots, the uh, violet. That, again, you can try and do uh, essential oils, concrete, uh, absolutes, super expensive. So with an aroma, a single aroma chemical, if you wanted to, you know, get by with a sort of powdery iris note without, you know, overwhelming yourself, you could either choose Ionone Alpha which is super powdery and very iris-like. I mean, this alone, you put it in a blend, a lot of people wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Or you can get the old trusty methyl ionone gamma. Both are very, very similar. If you smell them side by side, mo most people couldn't tell the difference. Uh, so I would say just get whichever one you think is cheaper. Um, methyl ionone gamma is probably more leaning towards, I would say, iris and Ionone Alpha is probably a little bit more violet, but Iris and Violet are so similar as a flower scent that a lot of people get them mixed up anyway. So either of these two will do just fine. 
The next floral I think everybody should have in their arsenal is neroli or orange flower, orange blossom, sometimes it's called. Again, this essential oil is super, super expensive. Um, and nobody really makes a good single aroma chemical reproduction of this. But sometimes if you go to the, the websites like creatingperfume.com, uh, Perfumers Apprentice, they make their own you know, pre-made accords, what they call like house accords. And they're from perfume, uh, Perfumers Apprentice, their Neroli Orange Blossom Accord is actually pretty darn good. Like this thing right here, it's like five bucks for this bottle and it'll last me months. And it's pretty, pretty good as far as an orange blossom. I mean, uh, it's convincing. Now this last floral, technically it's not a floral, it's more of an herbal, but to me it smells floral, so I thought I'd throw it in the, the floral category. And I think everybody needs this. Everybody needs some sort of lavender. Lavender essential oil is dirt cheap. You can get different kinds of ones. There's lavender and then there's lavendin. Lavendin, like a lavendin grasso, is a mix of lavendin and lavender. Uh, but it's very herbal and camphorous. Some people don't enjoy it. So if you had to choose between lavender and lavendin, go with lavender. Uh, like I particularly have lavender diva. A diva is the, the type of lavender flower. And this one's from France. Dirt cheap. This little thing right here is like, 15 bucks, smells wonderful. This lavender reminds me of that very sweet, soft lavender kind of opening from Dior Sauvage. I freaking love this one a lot. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the category of citruses. Now for citruses, there's a lot out there, but there's four main citruses that every perfume kind of has. And the citruses are really just top openings. So you're definitely going to want to get some sort of bergamot. You can go with bergamot essential oil. It's dirt cheap. Um, if I were to go with any sort of essential oil, if they offer a cold pressed version of it, get that one. Because the cold pressed versions are a little bit more robust, a little, they just have a little bit more punch and oomph to them. So if they have a cold pressed version, uh, get that. Um, if you can't find a, a bergamot oil, Givaudan makes bergamot Jivco. It's their aroma chemical reconstruction of bergamot oil. But the reason why they do that, and the reason why I actually have a lot of this, is because any natural citrus essential oil is very, it's very a volatile uh, material, meaning it evaporates very, very quickly for a natural. With the bergamot uh, Jivco, because it's made of a bit of naturals and aroma chemicals mixed combined, it actually lasts a little bit longer than the natural version. So sometimes just grab both. Like if you can afford to get bergamot essential oil and the bergamot Jivco, I like to blend the two so it smells real and it, the aroma chemicals kind of drags it out a little bit. It drags out that scent so it lasts a little bit longer. Uh, the next one that you should get in your citruses Lemon. Everybody's got to have some sort of lemon. Again, this one's a cold pressed lemon from Argentina. I love, this is the juiciest lemon I think I've ever smelled. It's just like, it smells like somebody just cut open a lemon and just smacked you in the face with it and you can just feel the juiciness. I love it. It's worked so well for summer scents. Um, now, opposite of lemon, you're going to want some sort of orange oil. Now, orange oil can come in many, many different ways. You can get sweet orange oil, you can get bitter orange oil, you can get blood orange oil. Uh, there's just so many different ones, but if I were to choose one, just go with something generic, and that's the sweet orange oil. And that's, it's not bitter, it's not overly blood, it's not, it's, it's just kind of like your run of the mill, middle of the road orange oil. It works great for any application. And then the last one, you're gonna to wanna to get some sort of grapefruit. Uh, grapefruit oils, again, much like the orange oil, comes in many different ways. You can get pink grapefruit, you can get ruby red grapefruit, you can get white grapefruit. And that becomes a preference because they all smell like grapefruit, but they're all a little bit different. Like the white grapefruit in particular, to me is a great top note. It's very sharp, it's very persistent, it's very stingy and in your face and it works great for a top note. If you wanna to tone it down a bit, you can get pink grapefruit. I think pink grapefruit is a good middle of the road. Or you can get the ruby red, which is the sweetest of the grapefruits. 
I chose pink grapefruit as a, you know, a first starter. Now, the next category, we're going to go into more of the spicy category. So spicy can be many different things. It could be spices like you would find in a spice rack when you're cooking. It could be incense. It could be a lot of things. So I kind of chose a lot of different spices here that I think everybody should have. The one thing, probably the most commonly used spice ingredient in perfumery is some sort of cinnamon. Now you can get different cinnamons. You can get cinnamon bark, uh, cinnamon leaf, cinnamon absolute, there's cinnamon tinctures. But if I were to choose one single cinnamon for the rest of my life, it would be cinnamonic aldehyde. It smells identical to cinnamon and it's stronger. So this little tiny vial I bought a heck of a long time ago and I have it diluted down to I think a 10%. I have another bottle this size diluted down to 10% because it's so strong. This is so strong. And it's so good though, it's so good. It just mimics cinnamon perfectly. And that's, that would be my choice for your cinnamon scent. Now, if you were gonna go with something a little bit more gourmand spicy, you can get nutmeg oil. Nutmeg oil, it's good. It's just, it's a very generic spicy cinnamon, or not cinnamon, very gourmand, kind of like, you know, off the spice rack kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's good to have. I would say you don't need it, but if you're a fan of spicy scents, it's a good thing to have. Now the next one, this is probably a must have and I love it. I love it. And for any spice category, I think everybody should have what's called allspice. And allspice is kind of like, it's a mix of all this, it's basically what it is. It's a mix of all these spices blended together. So it's all these different gourmand spices, and peppers, and it's very, it's just dry and scratchy. And at the same time, it's edible and mouthwatering. It's, it's your all-in-one go-to spice. Now, there's also uh, Perfumer's Apprentice makes what's called a spice, you know, their house blended accords and that mimics all spice as well. You can get either or to be honest with you. They're both great. Perfect if you're trying to go for that uh, Victor and Rolf spice bomb kind of feel, that spiciness. Uh, another spice that I think is a must have, pink pepper. Uh, this one's called pink peppercorn oil. Um, perfect top openings. If you're a fan of Dior Sauvage, love that, you know, that very sharp, zesty, pink peppery vibe. I think everybody needs pink pepper in their arsenal for sure. Uh, let's see. Now, technically this, this next one's not a spice. I didn't know where to put this in any of these categories, but it's, it's tobacco. It's a tobacco leaf. Now this one is a tobacco absolute diluted pre-diluted to 5% when you buy it from this company. And it's perfect for that, if you like tobacco accords or tobacco scents, especially in men's fragrances, this does wonderfully. It's, it's not a, a dirty, stinky tobacco. It's more of the, it's a sweet, almost a cherry tobacco. And uh, this one was uh, purchased from Perfume's Apprentice and it was already pre-diluted at 5%. I actually have this, this bottle here, I have another large bottle as a backup. I, I use it all the time. I love it. A good spicy top note. So cardamom, widely, widely used in perfumery. So cardamom is definitely, it's, it's a spicy kind of gourmand, but at the same time, it's kind of uplifting as well because it's used as a top to a middle note. Cardamom is used in so many fragrances. It's so popular, especially men's fragrances. It's widely used. Everybody needs cardamom. Now a bottle like this, a 15 ml bottle, it's about 15 bucks. It, it won't break the bank, uh, but it's something you have to have. If you, don't have. if you don't have cardamom, I mean, come on, you need it. The last spicy category, or the last spicy scent in the, the category I think you should have as a first time buy uh, you need frankincense and frankincense is just essentially, it's just incense and you can get it as an essential oil. There's many different things. They call it olibanum or frankincense. It's the same thing, just a different name. 
and that is more of your, not necessarily smoky, but the best way to describe it is incense, like those little incense sticks you burn, or if you're going to church and, you know, people are walking down the aisles with those urns and they're blowing the smoke of incense, it smells just like it. So if incense is your thing, grab it. But I think everybody should have some sort of smoky incense in their stash of, you know, must-haves. This next category, it's a slim one because there's so many of these. And these are your, I don't want to say they're aquatics, but these are more of your sea breezy, ozonic kind of materials. The most widely used one in perfumery is Calone. And that is the one that's associated with a lot of men's aquatic fragrances. It's got that, not necessarily sea salty, but it's very fresh, very breezy slightly, slightly sea watery. I, I want to say it's kind of like seaweed, but you don't get seaweed, but you do get some sort of sea vibe, but it's very breezy, sea, and aquatic. Cologne is probably the number one aquatic, you know, aroma chemical used. Now, if that's not your thing, let's say if you're working on a women's perfume and you want this same effect, but you don't want manly, fresh, you know, breezy seawater, they make Floral ozone. Uh, this is a 10% solution. I have a big bottle. I had to dilute it down to 10% because it's so strong. You have to dilute these down to 10% before you use it. This is the floral version of this. It's still very open air, breezy, semi-aquatic and wet, but it has hints of floral in it, and particularly like Lily of the Valley floral. So it's very fresh, very open, very breezy. Great, great thing to use in women's perfumes. So that brings us now to uh, the sweeter side of things, the more gourmand ingredients. And if I were to narrow it down to just three things, the one thing everyone's got to have is tonka bean. Tonka bean is in a ton of stuff. It's very sweet. It's an excellent fixative. It's an excellent base note. Uh, it's very gourmand. But tonka bean can be expensive if you buy the Absolute. I actually have the Absolute in, in my stash, but I rarely, I rarely use it because it's so darn expensive and I'm afraid to, to use it all up. So again, a lot of these retailers make synthetic versions of it and perfumersapprentice.com did an excellent job making their own tonka bean accord. And it works wonderful. It smells like the real deal. I mean, it's probably not as pungent as a tonka bean absolute or the real thing, but it smells identical. Tonka bean accord from Perfumer's Apprentice is probably a good first choice for your, your first pick. And then the last two uh, in the gourmand category. Now you're looking at these, you're probably like, wait a second, these don't look like you know bottles of anything. If you shake them up, these are solids, these are crystals. So these need to be diluted into, you know, little bottles like this. Or you could actually just drop the crystals in your per perfume blend, but I wouldn't recommend that as, as you're starting out. So as a first buy, you're going to want some sort of uh, vanilla note. Um, and there's so many different vanillas out there, vanilla absolutes, but you can get ethyl vanillin, which is... It's just like a little, it's a fine powder. I swear to God, it just looks like a, if the cops were here, they'd think I have a vial of cocaine or something. And it's lovely, but because it's a powder, you actually have to drop it in something like this and dilute it in alcohol. So you could actually take a dropper and use it in your blends. But ethyl vanillin, super strong, a great vanilla note. Now, the last gourmand you have to have, you just have to have this, and this is ethyl maltol crystals. Again, these come in powdery like crystal form. Probably can't see it in the camera, but this is this is your definite sweet note. This is so widely used in women's perfume and in men sometimes, but more so women's because a lot of women's perfumes can be so cloyingly sweet. It's from the ethyl maltol and this is, it smells like cotton candy. It's, I swear to God, it's like cotton candy sweet. Some people use it in their blends to kind of give more of like a caramelic kind of syrupy sweet. But when you put it in a blend, it comes across as just sweet, sugary cotton candy. And you should have it. Everybody should have it. If you want to add sweetness to your perfumes, that's your first go-to ingredient to try. Okay. So this next category is going to be your ambers. Now, ambers can be 
kind of two sides to the coin. You can get amber in a sense of ambergris, uh, amber green, or you can get amber, which is kind of like the fantasy accord. Uh, it's like a made up of a cord. If you ever watch that movie, Jurassic Park, where the old guy with the glasses that built the park has his little walking stick and he has the mosquito on a cane and it's wrapped in this little red, orange, glowing looking rock, that's amber. And amber is just a petrified solid piece of rock and it, it looks like glass, and, but it doesn't smell like anything. But people started to make amber accords and they, they call it a fantasy accord because people would be like, well, if amber did have a scent, what would it smell like? It would probably smell something maybe semi-sweet, a little bit balsamic, uh, definitely warm, definitely wet. Uh, so there isn't really a true amber material that you can buy. Uh, I had to actually make my own amber accords. Uh, but with that being said, you can still go to like perfumersapprentice.com, creatingperfume.com. Those folks there make a, their own version of an amber accord. And I think everybody needs it. Everybody needs an amber accord in their arsenal. Like if you're a fan, uh, like a men's fragrance, if you're a fan of Dolce Gabbana's The One, and that's heavily, 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 the bass note is an amber accord. And that's what gives it that warm, resinous kind of, you know, feeling to it. You need that sort of amber accord in there. So just go to Perfumer's Apprentice uh, or Creating Perfume, browse their ambers. They make different amber accords. Some are clean, some are a little bit warmer. And just pick any, any will do. So the next two for the amber category would be more of your ambergris. But these one, it's more of like ambroxan. So again, these are sold in crystal or solid form. You probably can't see it in the camera, but again, you have to dilute these in order to use it. So once you dilute it, it comes out into a liquid form. You can use it in a dropper. So ambergris comes in two forms, actually a lot of different forms. You can get generic, ambroxan crystals and that's the synthetic you know reconstruction of what an ambergris would smell like ambroxan anybody that's you know starting to make their own perfumes probably has heard that term before ambroxan it's it's in a lot of things in modern day perfumes in the past 10 years dior sauvage uh versace dylan blue uh, you know so many are what they call ambroxan bombs because they use this so heavily in their perfumes it smells great i love it it's like it's, it's just a warm, pillowy sweetness without it being too sweet. And it gives us this nice salty, sea, animalic kind of vibe to it. So the, I actually have two kinds of amber or uh, ambroxan crystals. You can get, Ferminich makes one called Cetalox. And, or you can just get the basic generic ambroxan crystals. Both, I would say, are very, very similar. Cetalox is a more refined, a little bit more delicate. It's, it smells high end to me. It's sweeter and a little bit more high end. I prefer Cetalox between the two, but this is more expensive. So if you had to get one of these two and you're like, I need Embroxen in my arsenal, I just need it. Just get the, just get the regular Embroxen crystals. They'll be, it'll be just fine. Okay, so this next category we're gonna talk about, it's a slim category. Um, these are kind of more of your manlier scents. So I kept these two to a minimal. Um, one is going to be your kind of mossy scent, and that would be your oak moss. So oak moss, super expensive, but it's also heavily restricted uh, in the perfumery world. Like there's IFRA restrictions, meaning you can't use X amount percent of it in your perfume concentrate because they think it's, it's toxic. So you can get Oak Moss Absolute, but you won't be able to use a lot of it because of the restrictions. So again, the company at Givaudan made Oak Moss Jivco, which is their synthetic version of it and it smells wonderful. I love it. It's, it's one of those things, like if you're gonna get one Oak Moss and just have it for your arsenal and just have the one, it would be Oak Moss Jivco. It's amazing. Uh, and then the next one that I would put in this scent of the manly kind of animalic mossy things, you need some sort of leather scent, something that would just 
leather or suede, and there's so many different ones out there, but the company uh, IFF made one called Suederol, and it's perfect. It's 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 suede, it's leather, and it's it's a reconst you know reconstruction of uh, what would smell like natural leather or suede, but it's all aroma chemicals, and it's 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 soft, it's smooth, and it's not. It's not overly animalic, but suederol from IFF is very strong. It's super strong. So I have just this small little, bo this little tiny vial right here because I had, I had to dilute it to a 10% solution just to use it. So this little tiny four ml bottle that you can probably buy for like $6 is gonna last you like over a year. So the last category I wanna go over is your green, uh, fresh green notes. Now, green can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but it's usually leafy, it's usually grassy. So you can grab yourself what's called Violet Leaf Absolute. It's pretty, I don't wanna say it's inexpensive, but it's obtainable. If you're a first time perfumer and you're grabbing your first time ingredients, you can probably pick this up. Violet Leaf Absolute, here's a 10% 10, uh, 10 solution. When you buy it, it comes in a small, tiny little vial like this, and it's thick, it's syrupy. You try to pour it, and it just kind of slowly sludges out because it's so thick. And then you dilute it to a 10% solution where it's easily used in a pipette. So Violet Leaf Absolute is very uplifting. It's very fresh, it's very green, but it also smells very wet. So if that's kind of your thing, if you like that green kind of leafy that was just after the rain, Violet Leaf Absolute does that wonderfully. Now, if you're not quite sure what kind of leaf, I mean, there's so many different green leaves out there. You can get, you know, Violet Leaf, there's Birch Leaf, there's all these, you know, other kind of leaves. Stem, I think uh, there's a, IFF makes one called Stem Own or something like that. And that's another great one. So, but if you don't know which green leaf you want to get, again, Perfumer's Apprentice knocked it out of the park with this one, and they made their own in-house green leaf accord where it doesn't sway towards any particular leaf in general. It doesn't, it doesn't smell like violet leaf. It doesn't smell like birch leaf. It doesn't smell like grass. It just smells green. And when I smell it, it's like, oh, I smell a little bit of grass. I smell fresh leaves. It smells wet. It's very fresh, very uplifting. And if I were to choose one aroma chemical to buy that captures just a green note in general, it would be green leaf accord from Perfumer's Apprentice. And then the last one in the green category. Now this is a single aroma chemical and it's strong. It's, it's pretty strong. It's your Cis-3 hexanol. And this is your green grass note. It's not a leafy note. So the best way to describe cis-3 hexanol is, let's say you just mowed your lawn and you have this giant bag of lawn, you know, lawn clippings from your lawnmower and you stuck your head in it and took a whiff. That's what this smells like. It's green grass, freshly cut green grass. Now, I lied, there's one more category, but it's an honorable mention. So this one doesn't necessarily fit into a lot of these categories, but I think it's one everybody should have. And it's more of a balsamic category, but it can, it can be used in many other categories than just balsamic. And that would be your benzoin. This one in particular, I hand selected for you guys because regular, oh, it smells so good. Regular benzoin or benzoin uh, is a very, very thick, syrupy material. This particular one is made by IFF, and it's their reconstitution of benzoin. But it uses real benzoin, but they also put other aroma chemicals in there so it's not so thick. If you ever got a hold of real, like, benzoin, like, in a bottle like this, you can see it's pretty liquidy but real benzoin, you go like this and it sludges out slowly. And things like that are just a nightmare when you're trying to use like a pipette and you're trying to pick it out and then you're trying to push it out and it's just barely squeezing out and then your pipette gets so gooey because it's so gummy. Uh, benzoin, they call it Benzoin Affiliac 63 from IFF is a friendlier, 
version to use so it's not so sticky and it smells just like benzoin. Now, I get a lot of vanilla tones, slightly balsamic. It's sweet, it's definitely sweet, but it's also resinous. And this actually could have fell into the amber category that we talked about earlier. Um, cause benzoin is actually part of the red amber accord that I mentioned earlier. And this is a big player in that accord, but by itself, it does wonders if you want to add some sweetness to your bass notes, if you want to add something sweeter, um, just a little bit more resinous. And it's a great, great thing to have. All right, we did it. We covered all the aroma chemicals and materials that I thought you should have as a first time buy as a DIY perfumer. And like I said, there's hundreds and hundreds of aroma chemicals that you can buy out there. But these were hand selected as a good beginners to start playing with. So you get a feel of each, a, a little scent from every category. That way you have some things to play with for like different top notes, different middle, different bass notes, different categories, different scent styles. And this is a good selection to start you off with. So in the description below, I'm going to list all these out again. And then I'll also link you to the probably the three or four websites where I would buy them. So you can kind of pick and choose and uh, comparison shop with prices and just buy what's, you know, best for your needs. So now let's move on to looking at storage of all this stuff. Dun, dun, dun. Alcohol, not the kind that you drink. That's your perfumer's alcohol. You're definitely going to want to, to pick this stuff up. You're gonna need it. Um, perfumer's alcohol, specifically, SDA 40B, 200 proof. You need 200 proof. Trust me, don't get anything other, 200 proof. This is what the pros use, this is what you're gonna need. Keep a lot of it on hand, trust me, you're gonna need it. Storage. Now, me personally, I like a discreet storage because I perfume in my dining room and I just do it when I need to on the fly. I use these two rolling carts that are on wheels so I can wheel these carts out into whatever room I want to use. I can throw them in the back of my truck if I wanted to. But the traditional method would be people would build a desk. They would have what's called a perfumer's organ, a specific seat, desk, table, all these beautiful shelves around it with all their materials listed in front of them. And it's kind of like an organ, like a piano player. And they can just grab off the shelf as they see it. My setup, because I want it discreet, and I don't want my place looking like a perfumery place, is I have these rolling carts. So anytime I open up one of these, it's like, cool, here's all my powders, all my caps. Here's all my middle notes and my florals all in one drawer. Here's all my aroma chemicals and just oddballs is what I call it. These are all my dilutions. And as you can see, it's just everything is just neatly organized in their own drawer. Here's a drawer just full of base notes only. Here's a drawer just full of top notes. Here's all my accord blends that I've created. And it just works. It doesn't mean you have to go this route. This is the route that I chose because I want a discreet setup. And so when somebody comes into my house, they don't see bottles everywhere. They don't see aroma chemicals sitting out. The place isn't stinking like a mess. They look like normal pieces of furniture and it works. But you don't have to go that route. You can, you can build a desk. You can have a perfumer's organ with all your shelves and make it look beautiful. This is the route that I chose. You can choose how you want to. So let's talk equipment. So you wanna start perfuming at home. You kind of have a general idea of what you may need, but you're not quite sure and you want a little bit of guidance. So I'm gonna go through the must-haves, the necessities that you're going to definitely want to have, and you probably can't make stuff without it. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to get is a scale. I mean, this one right here, probably maybe overkill for a first time buyer. Uh, this scale right here ran me a hundred bucks. It wasn't that bad. I actually have three scales. This is now my third scale. 
when I first started perfuming, I didn't know what to get. So I went on Amazon, I got like a cheap $20 scale, realized it wasn't very accurate, wasn't very adequate. So I moved up to a $50 scale, realized again, uh, wasn't cutting the mustard. This one did me pretty good. But the other two that I bought previously were a good starter scale just to get me in the right direction. But the point is, you're gonna need a scale. If you're going to do the drop by drop method, which is fine, when people first start off, they have their notebook and they're just kind of writing down their notes. Oh, I'm gonna add one drop of this. I'm gonna add two drops of that. But you're not gonna be very accurate. Uh, it's not gonna be very precise. Cause now let's say you make a blend and you're like, okay, now I want to, you know, make a bottle of this blend. You know, I wanna make five bottles. I wanna make 10 bottles of it. What are you gonna do? You're gonna sit there and be like, counting 300 drops of this, 500 drops of that, it just, it's not feasible. So when you get a scale, you wanna measure things by weight. And that's why the scale is so important because every time you place one drop of your chemical in the beaker, it will tell you the weight in grams. So when choosing a scale, there's two things that you're gonna wanna look for. One is what's the overall capacity of the scale? How many grams maximum can it go up to? This one in particular goes up to 200 grams, suits me just fine for all my, you know, tinkering and all my experimental blends. If I ever wanted to make a gigantic canister of something, this would not do. But for me right now, it does fine. The next thing that you're going to want to look for is what is the accuracy in readout, meaning how precise can it be? Is it something that measures like zero? 0.01 grams accuracy? Is it 0.001 accuracy? Like how precise will the scale get? This particular one goes down from 0.001 accuracy. Now, some of the ones from Amazon that I bought, that I spoke to earlier, uh, that were like 20 to 40, $50, they claimed they do 0.001 accuracy. I wouldn't believe it from a $40 scale, to be honest with you. Maybe it would read it out. I don't know how accurate it was as far as counting that down to that very fine grain of a percentage, basically. So the next thing from your scale, you're definitely going to need pipettes. Now, pipettes, you can actually get two kinds. You can get your disposable plastic ones. I have a gigantic bag sitting in the corner. I personally don't like using plastic pipettes. One, because it's a, it's a waste of plastic. They're disposable, you're throwing it out, and if you wanna be good for the environment, I chose to do glass. Now, the downside with glass, this, this is actually just one canister of my pipettes. I actually have over 100 of these, and they're a pain in the ass to wash because every time you use them, and with the plastic pipettes, they're a one-time use, you throw it away. You drop it, you use it. When you're done with your perfumery session, you take the pipettes, you throw them away. You throw out the plastic ones. The glass ones are reusable, so you can pop the tops off and now you're just left with the glass, but you still gotta clean the gunk out. And that's what the pain in the ass part is. So every time I'm done with a perfumery session, I, you know, I, I toss these all into a giant canister of you know, alcohol and soap, and I just let them sit for hours to dissolve all the, the oils. And then I gotta rinse them off and clean them out and stuff like that. It's a pain in the ass. But for me, the glass pipette just feels cleaner. Um, I, I just like using glass pipettes. It's up to you if you wanna do glass or if you wanna do plastic, whichever you prefer. Either way, you're gonna need pipettes. As far as pipette size, they come in short ones, medium, long, doesn't matter. Grab the small ones if you want, whatever's cheapest. The only time you need a long pipette is unless you're gonna have you know, these giant beakers that are like yay tall and you're really trying to get in there. Small ones are gonna be just fine. Which brings me now to the next part you're going to definitely need beakers. And this one has got so many fingerprints on it. So beakers, beakers, beakers. Your beakers are your friend. I have, I don't really have a lot of beakers. I think I have like seven or eight of them. And I chose to get these uh, 50 ml ones. Perfect size for working with small perfume blends, like experimental blends. Again, you're probably just doing a drop by drop, measuring the things on the scale. A small beaker fits in here perfectly. And one, I've never filled one of these all the way up to the max with you know perf perfume concentration. It's usually way down here. So, but they're perfect for experimental blends. They're small, they're not bulky. They, they work well with small droppers. So 
you can go on Amazon and get like a five pack of these 50 mLs for like 12 bucks. I mean, why not just do it? Um, the next thing you're gonna wanna get is empty glass bottles. They come in different kinds, clear, cobalt, green, amber. Uh, the, the only big difference is like, I like the clear ones personally because you can see through it and see how much you know, stuff you have left, how much juice is in there. But you do want to make sure you have some amber ones on stash or colored ones, depending on where you store your materials. If you're storing your stuff that's close to like uh, on a shelf uh, that has a lot of sunlight, sunlight could actually damage your materials if it's in a clear bottle because it deteriorates and just makes it age faster. This will protect you from your UV ray sunlights and will protect your material contents inside but not every material reacts that way. Usually it's going to be like your more volatile, like citrus, like bergamot, lemon, orange. Those are very not UV ray friendly. So those are the ones you're gonna to wanna to put in something like this. All your other materials, you're gonna be fine with a glass, a glass bottle. I would say to start off with, get the 15 ml bottles. These are perfect for storing, like if you're gonna make your own blend of something, if you make your own rose accord, if you make your own amber accord, and you make it and you can fill this up and you have your, your own accord now stored in your bottle that you could use at any time for your next perfume session. Now, with the bottles though, the cap is important. I cannot stress this enough. The cap itself you're gonna to wanna to get what's called the polycone liner cap. And I'm not sure if you could actually see inside there. But there's basically, it looks like a little funneled cone in there. And what that does is creates a perfect seal, airtight, for your material inside. Do not, and I repeat, do not store your materials in those bottles that have those little uh, dropper screw caps that have the dropper built in you're gonna ruin your material. I made that mistake my very first time buying all my, you know, my first supplies. I thought I would be so efficient by having the, the little droppers built in so I wouldn't have to waste you know, extra droppers. I ruined so much material by that because they're not airtight. And I found that out the hard way. One day, you know, I live in Southern California, these heat waves in the summertime just started coming up and I realized that my bottles the, the, the contents inside were slowly going down and what's happening was the heat was actually evaporating the contents because the seal on the top of the dropper wasn't a perfect seal and they never are. So you not only lose your materials, but a lot of your diluted materials, like if you have you know, your aldehydes like this, diluted to 10% in a dropper bottle, all the alcohol that, would, that was in there that was diluted slowly evaporates and leaves you with a bottle of an unknown dilution, like this is aldehyde C12 MNA and 10%. If this was in a dropper top bottle and I left it out for probably five months, the, the alcohol would slowly evaporate and it would no longer be a 10% solution. I wouldn't even know what the solution would be because the alcohol had left a lot of it. So don't get the dropper top bottles. Get the polycone liners. It's a perfect seal. You won't regret it, trust me. And another thing you're probably gonna want, a lot of times you're going to be making a lot of these blends and you, you're gonna wanna test them because of course you're gonna make a blend, you're gonna be like, okay, I wanna smell it, I wanna spray it on me. What, well, how do I do that? You can get these little 10 ml atomizers and Amazon sells them dirt cheap. I think I bought like a box of 100 uh, for 20 bucks and they're perfect for holding on to your perfume experiment. So as I make a blend, and once I'm done, I'll dilute it into you know, my perfumer's alcohol, I'll make it like an EDP concentration, and I'll fill one of these up, shake it up, boom, 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 spray it on, and you can smell your, your concoction right away. And then because it's a 10 ml bottle, it holds enough juice that'll probably last you a week. So if you smell it one day, you know, smell it again the next two or three days. See how the perfume changes over time. And you need to do that with, you know, an atomizer like this. So atomizers are super important. So with atomizers for your test blends, now, of course, if you do finish a perfume that you're happy with and you're like, oh, I've done it, I've cracked the code, I made my first perfume, I think it's perfect, I want to bottle it now. I want it to savior it for myself. 
you're going to want to get empty perfume bottles. And again, there's a ton of companies out there online that sell these. You can get them relatively inexpensive from a, like SKB bottling company sells them and they sell them in different sizes, different shapes. Uh, some are round, some are square, some are tall. Like you can choose the colors and stuff like that. Or you can just go on Amazon. I know like this particular one is like a little, it's a little 30 ml bottle, comes with a cap. I bought a, I think it was a five or a 10 pack for 20 bucks and I thought that was a steal. So anytime I make a fragrance and I want to gift it to somebody like a, a friend, a loved one or a family member, I'd be like, hey, I made you a fragrance. I usually just, boom, use one of these, it's perfect. The last thing you're going to need as far as equipment, and this is probably a no-brainer. You're going to need plastic. And you're probably like, BK, why do I need plastic? Because this crap is messy, let me tell you. Depending on where you're actually going to be working, some people are fortunate enough to have a dedicated room for perfumery. And they might have this beautiful organ with shelves and they sit down at a desk dedicated to perfumery. Uh, me personally, I don't have that luxury. I do it where I can, wherever I can. Like right now, I'm sitting at my dining room table filming this video with all my things. And what I'll do, before after before every session i just get just a basic sheet of plastic it's the same plastic that you see painters use when they put it on the floor and they're getting ready to paint a room and i cut large squares and you're going to want to lay it out because you do not want any of this stuff touching your wood table or your metal table or your plastic table because essential oils aroma chemicals will kill your table um, I made this, you know, in the beginning, I made that mistake where I didn't have any plastic and I noticed anytime I accidentally dropped or uh, left, you know, dropped something on the table, like just the slightest drop and I didn't wipe it up, the next day it would stain permanently. It would eat away, rot at the wood permanently. Protect your table. Unless you have a dedicated table that you really don't care about if it gets messy or whatever, get a piece of plastic even something as cheesy as like cellophane, saran wrap, like that cooking wrap, just lay it down. Just don't leave a mess with the oils on the wood. The last equipment that you will need for your perfume makings is a notebook. A notebook is essential. I mean, how else are you gonna keep track of all your experiments? I mean, like this one right here has all these ingredients and all these little checks and it just tells me all my different trials, my failures, my wins. Every time I made something, how many drops I used. Was it a win? I put a star next to it. If it failed, I'd cross it out and go to the next one and then to the next one. And you'll go through so many blends within a day. It's crazy. Like in a given day, I'll probably go through maybe four or five trial blends. And then I'll be like, okay, that's enough for today. And, you know, and then I'll start again tomorrow. But you need to keep a ledger and keep track of what you're doing. Because if you don't, how are you gonna remember how many drops or how many grams you added of what you know ingredient? If you don't have a notebook, you can do like a Excel, you know, Excel spreadsheets, that's perfect. Uh, especially if you have like Google, Google Sheets is online. I use Google Sheets now. I actually have this as kind of like my, pre, my prelim experiments. And then if, if something goes well, I'll transfer what was, you know, what went well into a Google Sheet, and then I'll take it from there with actual formulas and percentages. Uh, so, but you, you definitely want to start off with some sort of notebook, some sort of ledger to keep track of your your experiments, so you remember. So, with all that being said, I hope you found this video useful, and it was packed full of information that you needed to get you off on the right foot to make your own perfumes at home. Uh, so it's a little bit less daunting, a little bit less scary, and it kind of leads you into that path of now you kind of know where to go. Uh, so you'll find a lot of links in the description below where all these things that I've listed out, where you can buy them, some of the aroma chemicals and materials, essential oils, the ones that I picked out, I, I've listed them all out on the bottom. So we'll see you soon.